Hey, welcome to the show, Leading and Growing Your Real Estate Business. This is Coach James Short, aka Shorty. And this is a show for those within the real estate industry wanting to lead and grow their real estate business. It's a series of interviews that we conduct for those within the industry. So we're finding out what those leaders are within the industry. What makes them tick? What's their story? What are their strategies? And how do they how to become the leaders and the growers within the industry? But also it's an interview series with those outside of the industry. I'm always a big believer of, of looking at a whole different part of the pie rather than just focusing on one part of the pie. Because what it does, it allows you to have a different perspective, allows you to get snippets or gold, golden nuggets from those outside of the industry that can look in the industry and go, hmm, there's a different perspective. And so I encourage you to reach out to the guests. I encourage you to lean into these series to find out how can these pieces of information, experiences, stories help you lead and grow your real estate business. And before we get underway with our latest episode, just a little shout out to these amazing crew at Magic Mind. Magic Mind has been a, it's, it's a, it's a productivity hit in the bottle. I've been using these these uh, supplementations now for for a number of weeks, and the clarity, the focus, and the performance that I've been getting from these uh, nutrients in a bottle. They've got amazing vitamins, amazing minerals. They've got a bunch of mushrooms in there as well. It's a it's a great productivity hack that I've been using every single day. So if you want to try it out, head on over to www.magicmind.com forward slash James Short. And you'll be able to get amazing discounts on when you subscribe and when you try the product. And at the checkout, simply add in James Short 20 to get your discount. So head on over, Magic Mind, productivity in a bottle. Oh, I love it. Now, on with the show. We are honored and privileged to have this amazing superstar guest today with us, Glenn Hare, who is the co founder and financial advisor at Fox and Hare Financial Advice, an advisory that helps Australia's 25 to four, 20 to 45 year olds taking buying property, getting invested and achieving financial freedom from a dream to a plan to a reality. He's been voted Australia's best financial advisor at the Australian Wealth Management Awards, IFA's Thought Leader of the Year and featured on Financial Standards Power 50 Most Influential Advisors Ever Year every year since entering the profession. Oh my goodness, he is a mover and a shaker. Glenn holds a Bachelor of Commerce from Sydney's Macquarie University and spent his first decade in financial services as a banker at Australia's largest investment bank, Macquarie. It's an honor and a privilege to have Glenn on the show. Mate, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. James, thank you for having me. Really, really excited for today's chat. Mate, so talk me back to those days at university. Did you ever mm. think about starting your own financial advising business? Like where where did this concept come from? Um, definitely not at uni. I didn't really know what I wanted to do at uni. So I did a fairly generic commerce accounting degree, <laughs> just going, yep, I like finance. That'll get me, get me somewhere. Um, started at Macquarie Bank when I was 19, which then meant I had to um, go to uni part-time, which was a nightmare, working full-time and then go to uni, uni at night, which was was a bit of a drain. But anyway, did, did my time. And look, throughout my 10 years at, at Macquarie, really loved my time at, at the bank, um, but got a, got a bit of a taste for that, um, for the desire to, to probably step out and do something um, on 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 my own. In terms of the advice space, why why financial planning? I wasn't actually a financial advisor at Macquarie. I had a number of roles. I was originally in the institutional stockbroking business. At one stage, business banking. Um, at, at one point, I was actually selling and distributing products to financial advisors. But what I found was most financial advisors were really focused on pre-retirees. And retiree. So the average age of an advised client, so someone has a financial advisor in Australia is 58. Really? So most, yeah. So most people get to a point where they're like, 
oh, I'd really love to retire at some point. They go see. Oh, crap. Crap. I've got no, what what am I going to do? They go see an advice and say, here, this is what I've got. This is what my soup has done for the last 40 years, or I don't know what it's done. And they ask kind of two questions. Can I retire? And then often the follow-up question is, if I do, what's it going to look like? Um, Average age of our member base, 34. So we're working with a much younger demographic um, to really ensure that they're making the smartest financial decisions possible sooner rather than later. Um, And and the compounding impact that we can have on on these individuals or, or couples is um, pretty, pretty significant. So it's, it's, it's a really exciting place to be. That trajectory of getting someone in that right position at their mid thirties compared to their late fifties, that's a huge compounding effect. Yeah. Like that's massive. What are you noticing? Let's just unpack that for a second. What are you noticing are the biggest, um, biggest differences that you've seen, obviously, you know, with those older, older clients that you might obviously may, may or may not have, but compared to the younger in relations to, to their mindset and, and to their future planning. Yeah, mindset is an interesting one. So, and just in terms of um, who, who we do work with, so we actually don't work with pre and post retirees. If one of our members was was you know kind enough to you know connect us with their parents, we'd actually refer them on to another advice firm that specialises in their space. So we know what we're really good at, and we know where there's others that that potentially play uh, in that space as well. But from a mindset perspective, it's it's really interesting, and it definitely does shift. Um, but what we tend to see is that money is something that, you know, is, 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 it impacts everything, but it's also not everyone's strong suit. So some people are really good at what they do, but they're not really sure how to manage their kind of day-to-day finances. So it can be quite overwhelming for, for a lot of people. Others, they, you know, listen to, to podcasts or read books and, you know, do all the do all the Googling and they, they make some really smart decisions and then they kind of sit back and go, okay, cool, set some foundations, but but what's what's next? Yep. Um, and then the third is one that we do see quite regularly is option fatigue. There's so many options around, should I be putting extra money into super? Should I buy an investment property? Should I buy three investment properties? Should I diversify into the stock market? How do I reduce my tax um, liabilities? Um, and they know that they should be doing something, but they're worried about making the wrong decision. So then they make no decision. Mm-hmm. Very true. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. People's relationship with money and people's relationship with risk is, is a very individualized experience. Yeah, I love that. And and those those options are so true. You hear it so often time and time again. What what's what's that turning point? I mean, you mentioned the three, but what's that turning point where someone goes through and they go, I need that help, you know, between 20 and 45, as you mentioned. Mm-hmm. And I need I need that help. And they come to you. What's what's that usually decision well, that they've gone, I need that help? Probably because they know that they should be doing better than they are. Or they're in a point where they've again made those decisions. They're like, I'm just not sure what else I could be doing. Yep. Um, and, and it is really different. So for for our members that are you know the the younger side of things, so probably in their twenties, their income is is increasing. They've probably got a, you know reasonable amount of disposable income. And there's that turning point where they go, okay, do I just keep spending it on stuff? Or do I start making some really smart decisions around investing those funds and making sure that I do that in a really tax effective manner? For our members in their 30s, that's probably, it's more around, okay, I need to start kind of adulting for want of a better word um, in that, oh, you know, I've, I've, things are getting serious with my partner or I'd really love to get on the property ladder or I'm thinking about starting a family or I have started a young family. How do I make sure that I can support them? And for our members that that are, that are in the 40s, being really transparent, a lot of them uh, are, are looking at their position and going, oh, I wish I had these conversations 10 years ago. Sure, definitely. And and what are you noticing with the trends with, with that, uh, I, I guess, those people that are coming to you yeah. um, compared to those people that, you know, you, you hear out in the industry that, yeah, you know, it, it's a one day thing. I'll get to it one day. What yeah. are you noticing is, is the most difference in those two types of people? 
Um, good, good question. The biggest challenge I, I suppose that we face as a, as a business is convincing people that now is the right time to see, see a financial advisor and seek financial advice. Cause most people just think it's for old rich people. Yeah. All right. So a lot of our marketing, our tone of voice, our positioning is really trying to break through that preconceived notion and encouraging people to seek advice sooner rather than later to make sure that they're making smart decisions which as you alluded to earlier will have quite considerable compounding compounding impacts um it is easy to put on the back burner um people are so focused on the you know often quite busy in their personal lives even their professional lives and it's really interesting when working with people that are you know in a in for example a sales type role they know if they've had a good month or they know if they've had a good quarter like they're really clear in terms of what success looks like from that perspective what we look to do is overlay and put a similar lens on their personal finances as well um, because if we don't have really clear goals that we're working towards in our personal lives, and that might be buying a house, generating a certain level of investment income, potentially looking to step out and start your own business at some point, unless we take the time to step back and look at what the what 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 those goals are, then it's very difficult difficult to measure success. Hey guys, just a little side note here. How's it going? Are you on track this year? I know that sometimes this part of the year we can feel like we're in a bit of a grind, a bit of in the trenches. Are you on track from the original plans that you set out for the rest of this year? What I've realized is that within, with this time of year, we get so distracted and we've got trying to chase so many shiny balls and go down so many rabbit holes. And that's why I created a program called The 90. It's a framework that actually allows you to achieve more in 90 days than ever before. Some of the feedback that we've got from some of the people that have used the process, the 90, is that they've achieved more in 90 days than the whole previous year. So if you'd like to have the tools, have the techniques, have the framework on the 90, so you and your team can achieve more in 90 days than ever before. What it does, and it impacts you of, of how to get clear, what you need to do, and who you need to be to show up in order to achieve the things you want to achieve over the next 90 days. Simply head over to jamesshort.com.au, click on join the wait list, fill in your details, and one of the team members will be in touch and take you through the 90 framework. On with the show. Hmm. Um, so true. And, and an observation is a lot of, uh, um, is, is it, it can be quite challenging to set personal goals because like, oh, I don't know where I'm going to be in 12 months or three years. I don't know what's going to happen in five years. So then again, another reason to kind of put this stuff on the back burner. Uh, we encourage all of our members, let's drive towards something. Let's make sure that we're making clear progress towards those goals. If or when those goals change, which is perfectly okay and normal, pivot the financial strategies then to realign to those new goals. I love that so much. What do you think, like just on a side, like, mm. side question, mm. why do you think it's sometimes challenging for people to set personal goals, particularly around their finances compared to those maybe, as you said, in sales where they know, well, okay, I'm, this is, I need to, I'm working towards so many sales per month and this will earn so much. Why do you think the gap is around that? Um, I think it's the emotional overlay. Mm. So from a, again, if we're, if we're focusing on sales metrics and a, a clear, you know, target for a month or, or a quarter, there is a degree of emotion taken out of that. It's very easy to kind of quantify for want of a better word. Whereas when we're thinking about our personal goals, and I'll give you a really live example. This morning I met with um, a young lady living on the Northern beaches in Sydney. Um, she is, 32, single, and some of her goals are around, you know, looking to potentially start a family, starting to buy a house. She's acknowledged that she's single at the moment. So when we're having those goal settings, um, that goal setting session this morning, she was like, yeah, this could all change. Like, I just don't know what the next couple of years look like. And, and she reflected on that and she said, well, this is why I've been putting all of this, all of these financial decisions on the back burner, because I'm just not sure if... I have a really clear understanding in terms of what my future looks like. So what we were able to do was set some really clear goals um, from a financial perspective that enabled her to have more choice in the years to come. 
So I'm not saying you necessarily have to, you know, have to find a partner or, you know, have to go, uh, We, you know, the conversation around IVF came up and or you have to buy a house in the next three, five years. But what we were able to do was unpack what are some of the things that may eventuate and how do we make sure that we make smart decisions this financial year to ensure that you you have the capacity and the financial um, backing to be able to move on those different options and whatever may uh, eventuate in the time in, in the years to come. I love that because it's 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 so important ever to have those options. And as you said, they can change, but at least you have options rather than actually sitting on your hands and, and not doing anything and then spinning your wheels and then. Before you know it, it's like one year's done, three years done, five years done. You go, well, if I had some options back then, I could have made a choose your own adventure. At least I could go down some sort of path. I love that. Yeah. yeah. What do you go on? I was just going to say, you know, in terms of in terms of our, our our members, most of them, I would you know arguably say all of them are very goals focused, very driven, very um, you know their career is something that's really really important to them, and often you know I remind them, yep, that's amazing, you're doing really well in your career, moving through um, on 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 that path. We don't want to forget about life though. You know, the job and the career is important. I get that, but it, it provides you a degree of purpose. But we want to make sure that if you're earning good money or dispose, you have disposable income, we're also fueling that personal life as well. So we're not always reliant on the day job. And that's what I love about what you guys do because it is that holistic viewpoint. And right. it's having those conversations, those courageous conversations where it's like, hey, just you know, let's look at you wholly rather than just that career or that, that business aspect, which is, which is amazing. Um, what are you noticing? What are some of the trends within the the financial space industry, the financial advisory planning industry, and how has that changed over the years? Um, what are the trends at the moment? I mean, I mean, as an industry, uh, the industry is actually halved in terms of number of advisors. So lo- about five, there's, there's been a lot of um, focus on the financial advice industry over the last decade with the Royal Commission. Um, and, and and there's been a significant increase in, I suppose, the compliance side, side of things in terms of education requirements, things like that. And five years ago, there were 29,000 financial advisors in Australia. There's now a little over 15,000. Wow. So the industry, if we reflect on the actual industry itself, it's halved. Um, So I would argue that those that are a part of the profession still are those that are genuinely um, in it for in it, in it for the long for the long haul and legit um, and 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 the good guys right and, and the, and the guys, I, well I like I like to think so and look you know my personal opinion is the industry did definitely need to go through um, some um, reflection and self reflection and things like that but I, I'm really proud of where we're at at the moment and in terms of those and my industry peers it's it's very evident to see when you go to industry events and things like that there very much is a focus on um always doing right by by the end the end client from a from an, an advice perspective some of the key themes that constantly come up um in conversations certainly that that, that i'm having is the, the the investment strategy naturally you know whether it be property whether it be shares my personal view i'm an advocate of both I'm investing in property. I'm also investing in the stock market. I'm a huge um, advocate of diversification. Um, the The media has put a lot of um, attention on cost of living, um, which which naturally has certainly impacted uh, you know a, a subset of of our community. Um, but there also are a lot of people out there that are still you know doing quite well um, and have disposable income that they can make smart decisions around and you know, in certain certain circumstances, growing uh, disposable income. So tax naturally uh, always comes up in conversation and, you know, any investment decision we make is going to have tax implications. So managing and working out how do we, how do we manage that? Um, and interestingly, one that's probably not very exciting, but one that is really important. And I don't know why, but has come up more and more over the course of the last probably 12 to 18 months, is just around things like some of the housekeeping, like superannuation and insurances. So, you know, super is often forgotten by our, our members, you know, in their 20s, 30s, but 
Um, you know, if you're you're an employee, uh, you're mandated. You're you're empl you're telling your employer every single month where you want them to invest your money. So you, you may as well make sure it's working as hard as possible. Um, and for those that are self-employed, a big mistake that we often see is people forget about it and then five, 10 years out from retirement, they're trying to pump as much money into superannuation because it is incredibly tax effective. So it's not everything, but but it is it is sort of a consideration. And then the insurance piece kind of ties into that because a lot of people do have default insurance that super funds do provide. Um, and, you know, it's, it's about making sure that if something were to happen, how do you continue to pay the mortgage? How do you pay the rent? How do you pay the kids' school fees? Things like that. And a mistake I say in that space, is people look at it when it's too late. Yeah. So um, that would definitely be a takeout. Just make sure you understand what's what's happening in that space um, and, and be proactive around the decisions because if something were to happen, then um, it's kind of too late to make any adjustments there. Very true. Very true. So if I was a 30 year old mm -hmm. and I'm motivated and, you know, I sort of fit into one of those things of like, I've got so many options. What do I do? What would you recommend? What would be, I guess, the first three steps for them to, to take action around um, yep. obviously calling you guys, um, yeah. but, but what would be, so I guess one, two or three actions that they could take to start that process uh, moving yeah. forward? Good question. So, I mean, for for us, um, acknowledging that financial advice can be, you know, most people that reach out to us, probably about 95% of people that reach out to us have never seen a financial advisor before. A lot have never even really considered it. Um, so in terms of, and I can't speak to it for all advisors, but in terms of our experience, um, we offer everyone a 45, free 45 minute chat just to kind of suss out where you're at, what you're looking for, talk through our programs, fees, all that kind of stuff. So just to demystify what is, yeah. what, what, what can be, you know, uh, I suppose feel quite, quite daunting, but in terms of if I was sitting in front of a 30 year old, what would I be looking at? The first thing I'd be looking at is their cash flow. So how much are they earning and what disposable income do they have on a monthly basis? Um, so what's left over at the end of each month? Uh, and, and for those that do have variable income, so, you know, sales commissions, bonuses, things like that can be really challenging to, 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 to uncover because it obviously fluctuates. But what I've always found is if we can set a base cash flow strategy and then anything that you earn above or above and beyond what you need to meet kind of day-to-day -day needs, we then have the opportunity to, uh, I suppose, allocate that to particular wealth creation strategies. And naturally that includes investing in the stock market, looking at, looking at property, considering additional contributions. Um, how, we, um, how we also make those investments is very much a tax consideration. So an example would be if I was working with a couple um, that have pre, you know, previously kept their finances quite separate and the high income earner, they've got a high interest savings account and they're saving, saving, saving. If they're earning, if they're in the highest tax bracket, they're paying and they're earning more than their partner. If that cash was just sitting in an account in their partner's name at a household level, they'd be paying a lot less tax. Mm -hmm. But because they're earning more and they're just kind of, yeah, I'll just put it in my account, they don't kind of think, oh, well, actually, this is going to have a negative tax impact. And that goes the same when we look at how we invest, again, whether it be shares or, or property, um, and also then looking at different structures, whether it be trusts and investment bonds, which which I won't go down that rabbit hole now, but understanding cash flow, understanding um, what's, what's left over at the end of each month and how do we allocate that to build wealth, but then also make sure that we're not building wealth for the sake of building wealth. How do we align our financial strategy to the goals because what again we often see is people manage their finances in the left hand they're like yep i'm doing this this and this and then their goals are in the right hand so what we'd spend a lot of time doing is well how do we bring the two together how do we ensure that we're making smart financial decisions in line with the goals that we've agreed are important to us I love that. That's a beautiful metaphor around the left and the right hand. And I, 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 my visual just went straight to for them coming together. So I was like, <laughs> oh, you hit it. Nailed That's it. where the Nailed magic it. happens. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Uh, Glenn, on the show, we have our 60 second quiz to find out a little bit more about our guests. Are you willing to play? Sure. Oh, let's go. All right. What's your favorite movie? Uh, favorite movie, Gladiator. 
Fantastic. What's your favorite food? Um, I would default to Thai, but a second runner up would be really close would be Japanese. Nice. What's your favorite holiday destination? Um, first one that comes to mind is Thailand. It's close. It's cheap. It's amazing. It's beautiful. I'm a scuba diver. So that's a tick there as well. So yeah, we'll go Thailand. Nice. Do you have a morning routine? Yes. Up at five every single day. Um, make a, a shake smoothie, try and get as much nutrients into that that I could drink it as fast as possible. Take Larry, our greyhound for a walk, come back, start work at six. Fantastic. And what about an evening routine? Um, as you can appreciate from my early starts, I am I, I tend to finish up uh, around five o'clock. The evenings are pretty chilled. Probably go for another walk, something pretty healthy Monday to Friday um, for, for for dinner. I'm trying to get back into yoga. I was in a really good routine. Um, I train, I do CrossFit at lunchtime, but I was really trying to get back into yoga. Um, I was getting good. Well, good is subjective, but um, <laughs> trying to bring that back into my life at the moment. Nice. If you were to invite five inspirational people for dinner, they could be dead or alive. Who would they be? Oh, good question. Um, five people for dinner. Um, I don't judge me, but I, I think it'd be fascinating to have a conversation with Donald Trump. Just yep. like what is going on in his head. Um, I think that'd be a really interesting conversation. Simon Sinek. Um, big, big fan of the work that 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 he does. Um, who else would I want to have dinner with? Um, big, I love my house music. Um, I would have loved to have had a chat with Avicii. I think he's, I think he had a bit of really challenging life, and I don't know. I just would have loved to have a bit of a DNM with him just to understand what was what was going on. Um, uh, who else? God, I don't know who I'd invite. Um, Maybe we'll go probably Steve Jobs just to see how he powered through and built that yep. built that car thing uh, company. Uh, and then Martha Stewart, um, she is a boss. I was just watching totally. her masterclass um, the other the other night, and the the empire that she builds and how close she is just to, to the day to day of all of the different facets of her businesses is fascinating. So yeah, we'll have Martha along as well. <laughs> Love it. Fantastic. If you were prime minister for the day, what's one thing that you would change? Um, I would stop deforestation. Great. Fantastic. What's your, what's your best piece of advice? Do something. <laughs> Love it. Love it. So what's, what's coming up for you? What, what are your plans over the next six to 12 months? Um, business wise, the team's growing. So we're only well, we're, I say only, we're six years old. I don't know if that's young or old anymore, but uh, we're growing, growing quite quite rapidly. We've just had a couple of other, a uh, couple of new advisors um, come on board and we've got another advisor coming on later this year, um, which which I'm super excited about. Um, so from a business perspective, a, a lot of growth. And, and for me, my role's morphing into one more of leadership and training and support, which I absolutely love and and, and really getting a lot of, um enjoyment out um personally what's going on um two things so as i mentioned i live between tasmania on acreage down in tassie and then um up in sydney down in tassie we're rewilding a lot of our property so we've got a target to um to plant 100 trees i've planted 59 so far so i've got a awesome. i've got a little bit of been a little bit of a way to go Planting of the trees is the easy bit, but you've got to put meshing around them because there's yep. so much wildlife. Um, so you leave it in the ground for for more than kind of half an hour. And if you don't put meshing around it, there'll be a wallaby or something um, <laughs> chewing at it. Um, and then also going to Thailand for a week, <laughs> just, just for some downtime to do. Stay in a beautiful hotel in one of those big, nice hotel beds swim and just do absolutely nothing it's been a big year for for us so i'm i'm keen to just take some time to eat some good food sleep in um and probably a little bit of scuba diving love it so good so how can the audience uh, reach out find out more about you guys where should they go easiest place foxandhair.com.au so fox and hair as in the animals.com.au uh, or you can just just google us 
Um, on there, there's a bunch of resources, shares a little bit more about us and how we work with our members. But to be frank, the easiest thing to do would be just to book in a call um, with our member success manager, which you can do through the website. It's free. It just demystifies it. Um, and Will, our member success manager, is really open to answering any questions that you guys have. Awesome. Glenn, really appreciate your time, experience and expertise. Thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely no problem. Thanks, James.